I think, you know, it's the cheerleaders are now part of history. We're a part of pop culture and the whole 70s era. And she had said, you will design a uniform that will be known all over the world. Wait, wait. You know, when we think of football, that is an American tradition. And what we honor so much about football is, of course, the competition, the determination, the perseverance, the hard work, all of the great virtues of the game. And, and that's why we compete on Sundays, is, is to win. That's our goal, is to win, to be the best of the best, the most elite and the most professional that we can be. But our purpose is far greater than that. We are a game of unity. We're about bringing people together into a huddle that don't look like each other, that didn't come from the same backgrounds, that don't believe in the same things, maybe they're different religions, cultures, ages, and beyond. We bring that in a huddle to define teamwork. And then we inspire those who watch us to do the same thing. That's why they come out on Sunday. They look about like you. Everyone is different, everyone's a different age, but for that moment, they are coming together to celebrate what is great about America. They celebrate tradition. They celebrate competition. They celebrate integrity. And for us, that is why we play our game. Our cheerleaders have been a part of the organization, as you know, since the 70s and actually the 60s. We have a moniker um, that the Dallas Cowboys are often referred to, and that's America's team. Our cheerleaders are referred to as America's Sweethearts. That's an iconic name, but today we celebrate an acknowledgement and a recognition from the Smithsonian. Who would have dreamed we'd be here at the Smithsonian, standing here at the National Museum of American History, maybe being recognized as an American icon. There is no greater honor, there is no greater privilege than to share this with you today. Yes, the Dallas Cowboys, the NFL's original expansion franchise, one having accomplished so much during the first 58 seasons of existence, winning five Super Bowls, placing 16 members of the organization in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, inducting 21 men in their own ring of honor, establishing not only an NFL record 20 consecutive winning seasons, but also worldwide recognition as America's team took another step into American history. But this time, wearing those famous white boots made for dancing, the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders strode right into the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. On this very day, Charlotte Jones Anderson co-signed the deed of acceptance bestowed upon them in the nation's capital. The DCC, christened as a significant part of American culture, right up there in history beside such iconic treasures as Alexander Graham Bell's telephones, boxing gloves worn by Joe Lewis, a robe worn by Muhammad Ali, the Scarecrow's costume from The Wizard of Oz, the Muppets, Abraham Lincoln's top hat, a Michael Jordan Chicago Bulls number 23 jersey, and so much more, documenting notable moments and collections through the years. Jane Rogers got this ball rolling. And I just thought it was, they're an iconic uniform. It's um, part of football history, part of cheerleading history. I thought they deserved to be in the Smithsonian. So did Kelly Finglass, the former Dallas Cowboys cheerleader turned director for the past 27 years. You know, this actually started, my first letter to the Smithsonian was in 2002. I still have a copy of it. Um, trying to kind of pitch the idea that the Dallas Cowboys cheerleader uniform um, should be at the Smithsonian, and it takes time. It's not an easy project, but 15 years later, we're here. Yes, they are. Kelly pitching another letter request to the museum on January 4th, 2017, and to her delight, receiving the official invite to accept their donation on March 7th, 2017, after years of petitioning. Dorothy's red slippers caught my attention. I knew Dorothy's ruby red slippers were here. That's when I realized that they actually have a pop culture 
division in the National Museum of American History. And I think, you know, it's the cheerleaders are now part of history. We're a part of pop culture and the whole 70s um, era. We're a part of sports and they now have a sports division. Um, the cheerleaders uniform is a part of fashion. So into the Smithsonian they go. It is my privilege to include this collection from the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders, including two uniforms with palms and boots, one from the 1980s and one from 2011, the original 1977 poster, three Dallas Cowboys cheerleader Barbie dolls, and the um, Abby Bear, which is an important part of their cheerleading culture, awarded every week to the cheerleader who has gone above and beyond their capabilities. But the backstory of how this all became possible is fascinating. The Dallas Cowboys Legends Show is presented by AT&T, more for your thing. That's our thing. The Texas Lottery, play the Dallas Cowboys scratch ticket today. It's your ticket for a chance to win big. And by NFL Game Pass, you'll never miss a game again. Enjoy full access to coaches film and game replays from week one to the Super Bowl. Subscribe at DallasCowboys.com slash Game Pass. The Dallas Cowboys came into existence in 1960. The Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders came on the scene in 1961. For their first 11 seasons, they resembled nothing like we've known for all oh, these many years. They were all high school kids until we went to the, our older girls. Meet Dee Brock, the very first Dallas Cowboys cheerleader director. Back when these high school girls were dressed in pleated skirts and sweaters, hair tied up in bows. You know, sis boom ba kind of stuff. I was teaching at El Centro College. I was on their first faculty. And just getting the new college going, you know, was really something and it was really exciting. Dee also was a model, but most of all, she was a forward thinker, just like Cowboys first president, Tex Schramm. What were the chances two progressive people would just happen to meet? Neither had a shy bone. And as the 1960s turned into the 70s and the Cowboys finally advanced to their first Super Bowls back to back in 1970 and 71, Dee knew something needed to change. And that change came about because, as you recall, perhaps the Cowboys went to two Super Bowls in a row right together. And <clears throat> I took the team each year to cheer at the Super Bowl. And this may be shocking, but I asked Tech Schramm to pay their way, and he said no. He said, if you're going to take the team, you're going to have to find the money yourself. <clears throat> so I did. I got on a local television station and made my case, and uh, some man generously wrote me a check uh, to take the team through the first one. And the second one, I appealed to him again, and he was only half as interested. <laughs> but it, it didn't take much to get the rest of the money together. It was a real challenge to keep the team sort of together when we got to these Super Bowl cities. After the second Super Bowl, I said, you know, I think we need to go to an older girl. And he was, an older girl, what do you mean? I said, 18, <laughs> 18 to 22. I said, we need to get more sophisticated uniforms. And I think we need to just give up the idea of cheering and say we're going to be a dance team and we're gonna really be entertaining. And he said, oh, well, you know, he liked that idea. And he thought it was good. At the time, Tex was just considering cheerleaders and he thought he wanted models to be the cheerleaders because he wanted beautiful women. And I said, well, do you really want them to lead cheers? And he said, oh, yeah, of course. And I said, well, you, you definitely do not want models then. And I said, most models wouldn't have the stamina to do that. I mean, it may look easy, but it's hard. That led to tryouts. D and the Cowboys looking for dancers more than just cheerleaders. Not an easy double. That also led to D hiring a choreographer, friend Texie Waterman, 
who Dee paid out of her earnings since Tex told her he couldn't afford both of them. And after tryouts, that led to what must be remembered as the Magnificent Seven, the seven women Dee thought could handle the job. One of those was Carrie O'Brien Sibley. They made an announcement on KBIL radio, and uh, my mother heard it. And she called me and she says, Carrie, they're having tryouts for the Dallas Cowboy Cheerleaders. And I said, oh, okay. I mean, I, and I have a twin sister, identical twin sister. And so I said, okay, well, I'll talk to Sherry. And Sherry goes, oh my goodness, let's go try out. So we went and tried out. And um, I made it and she didn't, but she made it the next year. She drug me to the tryouts. I had just finished college with the Apache Bells. I was danced out. And I thought, okay, well, it's a challenge. I'll go and try out. Well, out of 105 girls, not only was she chosen, but also selected captain. Maybe it was her experience, having actually performed with the Tyler Apache Bells when the Cowboys won their first Super Bowl, Super Bowl VI in New Orleans. Then there was Von Seal Baker. I always wanted to be a cheerleader. I was a cheerleader in college. I was the first African-American cheerleader at my college, Texas Lutheran College. And then when I came back to Dallas, they were having the professional thing going on. I tried out to go in high school and I never made it. And so I decided I'm gonna go for it. And I tried out and I made the Dallas Cowboy cheerleader squad. Neither were trained in dance. They just liked to dance. We just heard that Texas said she wanted a Broadway show on a football field. And that's what she did. With seven young ladies, Dolores Makeda, Anna Carpenter, Denavoy Nichols, Carrie O'Brien, Rosie Hall, Dixie Smith, Von Seal Baker. The dawning of a new era in cheerleading. These ladies danced. They were classy. But now, well, they had to dress like dancers. understood better than anyone. If she was going to have dancers, why, they had to look like dancers. Right, Tex Schramm? So while we were talking, he said, well, I, I said, well, we'll have to get new uniforms. We, we need a more sophisticated uniform. And I said, the, the, no skirts, short pants, and the bare midriff. Enter Paula Van Wagoner, the second essential part of the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders landing in the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. Let her tell the story of how 46 years later, she ended up right in the middle of the ceremony in Washington, D.C. In 1972, Tex Schramm and my boss and Lester Melnick that owned a fashion store here, they got together and they wanted a new uniform, so my boss asked me if I would design a uniform. And I said, sure, it wasn't a big deal. So I got together with Tex Schramm, and he told me what he wanted. They were gonna have sexy dancing girls, and he wanted it to be something Western because of the cowboy's name. But it had to be in good taste. So I put together a sketch, and had it made, and two days later, we took it back to Tech Trim for him to uh, approve or tell us what he wanted to change. And I walked in with it on, hanging on a hanger, and he said, we have to see it on a body. So I went and put it on, because I was the only one there, and they accepted it, they liked it just the way it was. Rather amazing that this lady who was designing junior dresses, sportswear, and occasionally children's wear for a company called Large Westway, a lady schooled at the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York and who had moved back home to Dallas, was the one who designed something that turned out to become so iconic. I mean, they could have asked anybody. It just happened the way it did. I was puzzled because that never done anything like this, any team. But in a way, I was lucky because of the time. That was the time of the hot pants and the go-go boots. Um, and it wasn't 
hard to put in the cowboy logo. All I did was stars and fringe. Just happened to work out. But in two days? Uh, that's normal. Mm -hmm. Because all I had to do first is get the idea in my head, sketch it, give it to my assistant, and they made it and brought it back to me. The first Dallas Cowboys cheerleader to be fitted, if you can believe this, the first one to actually see the new uniform, Von Seal Baker. I couldn't believe it. So I got there five hours early. And so I was just sitting there in Lavinia, the one that sold and everything. She came out and she goes, why don't you just come on and you'll have the first one cut. And that just, I didn't even know at that time what that meant. But I'm so proud of having the first one cut. Yeah, she put in all me and stuff and she had her measuring tapes and she was going, I got to have it so much, so many inches down here. So when you dance, you know, she had all of that down. And I was just like, whoa. I've never worn anything skimpy like that before. And Carrie? I never will forget going to get fitted for it. I thought, I thought I'd become a movie star. <laughs> and if this was a thrill for the initial seven cheerleaders, you can imagine what took place on August 5th, 1972, when the newly designed Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders first walked out for the reigning Super Bowl champion Dallas Cowboys first home preseason game at Texas Stadium. I just felt like, I felt like a million dollars in that, in the costume, in the uniform, and it took off like nobody's business. When we first went out on the field, I mean, the roar of the crowd, there's nothing like it, and the crowd went nuts. America's sweethearts were born. So there they all were at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. Charlotte Jones Anderson, Kelly Finglass, choreographer Judy Trammell, members of the DCC staff, current DCC uniform designer Lisa Dobson, uniform belt designer Brad Oldham, four of the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders, and of course, Paula Van Wagner, the little known lady finally receiving her due 46 years later designer of that initial Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders uniform that basically has survived the test of time with only minor alterations. And if you think the backstory of this DCC display entering the Smithsonian is rather fictional, let Paula Van Wagener tell one more say what story. One story that the cheerleaders like is in 1970, my best friend Sue and I went to a fortune teller uh, that was our birthday present to each other. And the fortune teller let us take notes, but she didn't know anything about us except our name. She did not know our occupation. And she had said, you will design a uniform that will be known all over the world. No way. Or, way, way. And she didn't know I was a designer either. Or this one, if you believe in fate. Paula's nephew, John Van Wagner, married Inga, and in 1995, she became a, you guessed it, Dallas Cowboys cheerleader, wearing the uniform her now Aunt Paula had designed. So I auditioned for the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders in 1992, and I was engaged to John Van Wagner at the time, and it was after my audition that it was mentioned in a very casual family gathering, you do know that Aunt Paula designed the uniform, and it was kind of a, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> and it was, she's a very, very humble individual, and it's not something that she spoke of very often or, or publicly, so it was an interesting tidbit of family information to learn, and then when I cheered in 1995, 1996, I was even more um, indebted to her for what she had created and to have the family tie that I got to represent the Cowboys wearing her uniform design. Can't make this stuff up. While the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders uniform and boots and palms and poster were center stage, 
Paula Van Wagener was the well-deserving queen for the day. If I, if I could have a parade in honor of Paula, I would be the one, yes, to, to marshal it for sure. She is, as I said, such a humble and soft-spoken individual. She's not one for the limelight or spotlight. Well, both shined on Aunt Paula on this day. Her two-day design of the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders uniform, which was obscured for the majority of these past 46 years. I, I think that's that's what's fascinating. And I asked her, I was like, did you did you design this with the intent that it would be around for forever? And and, and did you actually understand what you were designing at the time? Of course, she said, well, no, you, you know, this is, this was what I do every day is, is design costumes and, and uniforms. And, you know, it, it was just another day at the office uh, for her. And, you know, she has an incredible story behind it. And the, the legacy and tradition that, that she created on that piece of paper, it's an amazing story. And it's finally been told and will last forever, living on in the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. For all those who come after us, the story of so many people having a hand in this iconic tale. Tech Schramm was a uh, visionary, that's for sure. He had very bold vision, with, uh, especially with the cheerleaders. And the combination of the new uniform in 1972 and the poster in 1977 and the Super Bowls and the television show Dallas, it was just all, all the stars were aligned and they were pointing at Dallas, Texas. Here they are, America's sweethearts, often imitated, never equal, your Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders. The Dallas Cowboys Legends Show was presented by AT&T. More for your thing. That's our thing. The Texas Lottery. Play the Dallas Cowboys scratch ticket today. It's your ticket for a chance to win big and by NFL Game Pass. You'll never miss a game again. Enjoy full access to coaches' film and game replays from week one to the Super Bowl. Subscribe at DallasCowboys.com slash Game Pass.